This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. Hey there, thanks so much for tuning in to the show. I've got a conversation with a German maestro, Stefan Kumra, to share with you. Stefan is the frontman and vocalist in Obscura, and therein lies the catalyst for our conversation because the group have a new album out for 2021 titled A Valediction. It's out right now, right this minute. You can tune in via Spotify, or even better, go and buy the physical product on the group's website or the Nuclear Blast label store. Something else about Stefan is that uh, he's the he's one of the few people that could honour the late, great Chuck Schuldiner as he stepped into his shoes in the Death to All touring tribute, the legacy that still keeps the metal flowing freely on behalf of Chuck. I think it was about a decade ago or so now that he was actually last performing in that group. But either way, do go across to YouTube and check out some of those clips if you're interested. Now then, for the podcast listeners, we're about to dive into a tune from A Valediction. This one's titled When Stars Collide, and once it's finished, we'll dive into the chat. And for you YouTube viewers and listeners, we're going to dive into the chat right now. Let's go. Stefan, how are you going? Hey, I'm doing fine. How are you? Good morning to Dana. Yes, good morning indeed. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I should I should ask, have I pronounced your first name correctly there? Is it Stefan or Stefan? I apologize if I've got it wrong. Uh, Stefan. Stefan. There you go. Gosh, I'm so used to I'm so used to speaking to people from all over the world that I think because it's it's obviously Stephen in English, isn't it, Stefan? And uh, I think uh, a bit like my name, Andrew. You know, Andre, Andreas, all of these sorts of different names, and you're never sure how to pronounce them from the get go. But thanks for clarifying. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> no worries. How's uh, how's the interviews been going for this one here? Well, so far quite easy. I'm in the in the interview uh, marathon since probably uh, five weeks. So mm-hmm. a lot of interviews today, mostly interviews from down under. So you, you're also located in Australia, right? Correct. Yes. Yep. Uh, so I had uh, the pleasure of talking to many, many uh, fellows with uh, similar wonderful English accent. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, we it's uh, it's unique amongst the English speaking world, I think ours, isn't it? But I think I think whether you're talking to I know from experience when you're talking to people in North America in particular, they have a lot of trouble distinguishing the difference between the Australian, the New Zealand, and the South African accent. We can't understand why, because we all think we're so different, but there you go. <laughs> well, for us, it's all English. Uh, I, I can differ between uh, British and American English, but beyond that, well, if I don't understand anything, it's probably because the person is from Manchester, but that's it mm. then. Oh yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. The English, yeah, they they tend to have a different accent depending on which five kilometre direction you walk in. <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed that. I've confused some English accents, particularly from around the the Midlands. I think it might be. Uh, it might even be Manchester to your point with an Irish accent. I thought, how could I get that so bloody wrong? But there you go. Uh, let's not even talk about Glasgow. Oh yeah, yeah, the old Scots. Yeah, I've got quite a lot of Scottish people that listen to the show actually, and uh, uh, my my ancient heritage is from Scotland, so um, that's nice to sort of have that that connection there. I've got to say, I don't understand the word. We had uh, U.S. <laughs> Americans touring with us. Uh, we made a stop in uh, in Glasgow. They didn't mm-hmm. understand anything. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, <laughs> lovely. Yeah, you get that. But then you've got the international language of music to connect with people, right? Yes, blast beats and heavy metal. Love it. Indeed, yeah, indeed, yeah. And look, there's plenty of that on this new album, A Valediction. Love the title. Um, talk about that. Yeah, it's full of light speed, near classical technical wizardry that Obscura is so well known for. Now, look, as, given that it's the 18th of November, it'll be out tomorrow, the 19th. So... Is it one of those things where you're excited, a touch nervous about how it'll be received, or are you a bit of a, a bit of both? 
Actually, it's both. I mean, I'm uh, 20 years in the game, and releasing an album is always something special. But uh, it's uh, some kind of routine at the same time. We are, with Obscure, we release an album every maybe three years, more or less. And uh, of course, we celebrate it. So tomorrow, here it's the 17th, so in two days, at the 19th, uh, when the album is out officially, we definitely have maybe one drink at the night. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. I have a few more than that. You've got great schnapps there in Germany, I hear. Oh, Jesus, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, look, it's... Um, from the perspective that fans, by the time they listen to our chat here, the album will be out. But it's more of the same, and I mean that in a really good way, okay? You guys, when you release albums, you tend to build on it incrementally, meaning that you don't change the sound template a whole bunch. But that's a great thing as far as fans are concerned because there's there's bands that sort of shift the template a bit too much and then fans go oh shit what have they done here and then they've got to sort of make up for it on the next album and I don't think that's ever going to be an issue for you guys not at all we always uh, stick to the core of the band <clears throat> and uh, if you dismantle everything to the core we are a death metal band nice yeah. uh, with different influences but to the core we are a death metal band and we will always be so the framework is uh, always has been there we always uh, look left and right towards progressive music to even some black metal some power metal anything so influences can be manifold but in the end we have established our own sound within the last i would say two three four albums depends Mm -hmm. where where you see it but um to be original and uh, have an own identity i think this is uh, more important than being able to pull off whatever wizardy on the guitar so for me it's more important to have our own sound our own voice than uh, showing off whatever you can do and uh, with the new album we definitely stick to that direction because there, there are some quite easy to play songs there are, um, when it comes to the technical part or progressive part there's some easy to digest parts but we also consider well to go beyond everything that's possible somehow at some points. But this this balance is something that makes the entire album interesting. It has a bright musical palette of different styles. Freddie Nordstrom called us B.O.M., Best of Metal, <laughs> because you have everything in between, like caveman music, uh, like a song like The Wild Usurper to Rainbow and uh, White Snake riffing, clean vocals. Mm-hmm. It's everything in between. And the album was written with a quite uplifting pace within our band members so we really enjoyed making music and we all put together all ideas we had and therefore with the core sound the band has and all the influences from each members it's well it turned out to an interesting album that literally goes to 11 yeah it does indeed yeah and look you mentioned somebody in there that i want to talk to you about freddie nordstrom and you're working with him again uh, but what is it? I mean, he, he's worked with so many great metal bands and can can help bands mine such a fantastic sound. So what is it about Freddie that you feel makes him so sought after by bands? And what do you like about working with him? Uh, there are many stories, um, to be honest. I would start with uh, the productions he did in the past. Hmm. I grew up with all of those records being released in the mid-90s, early, late 90s. Let's say in the 90s. Arch Enemy, At The Gates, uh, Demo Borgir, In Flames, all those very, very important uh, releases he produced. Those records are timeless. If you would release them as of now, they would completely up to up to top notch and uh, still be, well, at number one when it comes to the production duties. So this is really something I was uh, looking out for. But... I'm not bound to the past. So what happened in the 90s is cool, but we are right now in 2021. So what really blew me off was the production he did for a British band called Architects okay. quite a while ago. And it's it's a different style, but it was simply fantastic how he simply, well, unfolded even the tiniest little details in, in this album. It sounds so deep and white and warm at the same time. It's beautiful, really a beautiful production. 
So he definitely proves that he did great music in the past, but also right now in present. And that was one big reason. The second, I'm a guitarist. Of course, his guitar sounds are legendary. <laughs> Not only Slaughter of the Soul, but so many other productions he did simply are driven by a fantastic guitar sound. And this is something that is a connection to our music. We established our own sound for more than a decade. We work with Angel Amps. So uh, what we did working with Frederick is simply blending both. We sent him our, our amplifier from the company Mm -hmm. and uh, blended it with his uh, experience in making a weird guitar sound, great sounding guitar sound. And <laughs> I've seen many things in my life, but what he did with uh, different amps and uh, different mics in different positions was definitely something beyond. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> on, top, on top, he's quite a, quite a character. He's a walking encyclopedia with a thousand stories, but, but at the same time, you feel so welcome even if he's a producer and also uh, his assistant engineer, Rob, hmm. they, they've, they've seen so many things. They've done so many bands and productions and still you're there as a, well, a blank page for them and you're still feeling very welcome. And this is as much as important as their experiences. Yeah, and, and you made a really good point throughout. They're very well articulated, by the way. But uh, his work on Slaughter of the Soul, I've, I've spoken to so many musicians that have worked with him and, and a couple have given me very good stories about any uh, pieces of insight, if you like, about the work that he did with At The Gates on Slaughter of the Soul. So did you talk, did you, have you spoken to him about how he achieved that magnificent guitar tone on that album? Uh, we shared a couple of stories, but we were not looking to copy any of his guitar sounds. So, uh, but what we figured is uh, he uses the same angle amplifier we used, but his version, his model is from 1996 or 95, I'm not sure, but one of the yeah. first ones. So <laughs> that was quite, quite interesting. So um, just when it comes to the feel, we thought, okay, this producer with this studio, we work with our band. And when we entered the studio, we figured, okay, <laughs> he's using more or less similar and same equipment as we do, but since 20, 25 years already. So that's simply a match and uh, yeah. quite cool. When it yeah. comes to start of so we mostly talked about vocals because we, we talked about uh, when we recorded uh, vocal tracks, about a little bit less tompa, more tompa or no tompa. <laughs> because gotcha. it was so so close to the uh, at the Gates recordings he did. So that was really cool. And he's not a guy who tells you what to do. He just makes, um, well, he offers you like this way or that way. Maybe he gives an idea there, but he's not one of the persons trying to take over a production. And that's really cool. You work as a collective on an album. So you need a band that gives something like you, first of all, you need to be prepared. Of course, you have to have good music that is uh, somehow re uh, relating to a certain mix. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, you need a producer that is experienced enough, well, making it even better. And therefore, it just turned out fantastic. I'm very happy and I would love to go back to Gothenburg as soon as I can again. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah, great team. Great team, by the way. But... Um, it doesn't sound like you had many challenges, but is, is that the case? Did you have any challenges to overcome throughout the writing and the recording process? Well, recording was planned a little bit different in the beginning. Um, the pandemic hit us as well as everybody else. So uh, the album could have been released probably half a year earlier. Mm. We had to switch the recording studio because first, uh, initially we, we thought about recording in the same studio we always used in Germany, but since the travel restrictions, uh, well, let our bassist from the Netherlands and a drummer from Austria not traveling to Germany. So we simply had to postpone this and skip it. And in the end, we had to de uh, decide in between, well, decision A, we are not recording any album, or decision B, we're going to use national studios. Mm -hmm. And that was something I was quite concerned because I'd rather have an engineer next to the musician the musician focuses entirely on um, on the performance and the engineer is doing what he can do best. So this was not given in one place. So, well, 
We had to record in national studios. I was able to fly over from Germany to Gothenburg and recording vocals, acoustic guitars that do all the reamping with our second guitarist. So in the end, it turned out really, really well. It turned out better than expected because we had one very important fact, uh, factor that helped us. And that was, first of all, time. And second, um, the ability to simply make a pause when you uh, tend to overplay. I mean, you, you see what kind of music we are doing. If you're playing 10 hours a day for a week long recording music like this, maybe the last takes are not that good as you might think anymore. Mm -hmm. So we had the opportunity to record um, in smaller quantities a day, and that helped a lot. So we kept a certain spontane spontaneously, a spontane approach, but at the same time, there are no mistakes on the album. And this somehow balanced out something we probably could not have achieved in a, in a regular studio environment. So I always try to see opportunities and make the best out of the situation. And luckily, this time it turned out really, really well. Nice. Yeah, it has turned out really, really well. Yeah, justifiably proud. I understand that. And uh, the, the lyrical themes this time around, how do the lyrical themes link back to the title of the album, A Valediction? <clears throat> well, um, A Valediction itself is basically a, well, a headline for the entire album. There are different stories leading uh, to the headline and... Some of the stories are simply dealing with the loss of friends, family members, and musicians. I had the, uh, the chance to share a stage with, for example, mm -hmm. Sean Reinhardt yes. from uh, Death yeah. and uh, Sonic. The last song on the album Heritage was written the week he passed away. He's one of the guys I had the, the chance to share the stage with. We played together in Death to All. He was also supposed to be a drummer on Cosmogenesis back in the days. So mm -hmm. we had uh -huh. a, a certain story. Sean Malone passed away a couple of weeks later. Mm -hmm. Then we had Alexi Lyo, we toured with. We have the, the bassist uh, of my other band, the Cabra, who just passed away last year. And all this somehow, well, made me as a 36-year-old guy reflecting a little bit about the past. So this, that was the personal side. But on the other side, the entire band made a big reincarnation, so to say. We finished the four album chronology. Uh, we changed the record label, the producer, we went to Freddie Nordstrom, even the, the, uh, the artist who is painting our artworks changed. So everything new from scratch mm -hmm. and it's like uh -huh. a, a new beginning and sometimes a valediction, a farewell is something, well, to leave behind and open a new chapter. And literally it's a new chapter for the band. And we are in a similar situation as we have been in 2008 when we signed our first record deal to, to Relapse Records. And back then we started to tour international. We, uh, well, released our first album worldwide and everything felt like new. And now it's exactly the same. We have a new partner with Nuclear Blast. We work with Elidan Cantor. We worked uh, abroad for the first time producing an album. Everything new, but still the band. <laughs> it's yeah. like going back to school, but you already have the experience of 20 years. It's really cool. You mentioned death alumni in there. Now, I know that you performed you, that, that heavy crown that you had to wear performing Chuck Schuldiner's role. So when was the last time that you performed in DTA, the Death to All tribute? I think the last tour, it, it was either Europe or South America. I think it was, uh, ah, it was the symbolic tour in, uh, in Europe. Yes, I remember that. Uh, with Gene Hogland, Max Phelps, uh, Bobby Kalbe, and Steve DiGiorgio. Really cool. Fantastic people. Uh, aside the music, uh, if you just uh, strip it down to the characteristics of uh, the people behind it, great, great persons to hang out with. Seriously, and I'm proud to consider them as my friends. Nice, yeah. I've spoken to quite a few of those people that you mentioned there, and yeah, to your point, very easy to talk to, like, like talking to you now. So easy to talk to, but they're, they're, they're the originators, aren't they? They're guys that helped craft the music and invent in a lot of ways and innovate the music that we all love. Yeah, absolutely. They've been uh, groundbreaking, groundbreaking uh, releases back then, and they're timeless as well. If you listen to Symbolic these days, pff, fantastic record. Hmm. 
Indeed, yeah. Look, I get the impression, and I know you're classically trained, uh, that you could play any type of music that you set your mind to. So what drew you to extreme metal? Um, I think it's simply the love of music. When I was uh, starting listening to this kind of music, I didn't play guitar at the time. So I was probably 13, 14, 15, around, uh, around that time. So I was simply fascinated by the really dark approach and somewhere the mel- melody, uh, the harsh lyrics, and at the same time, this, this pure and, uh, well, let's call it energy that is there in the music. And back in the days, there, there was no internet. There was no, there was no, uh, no streaming service. Uh, you could uh, simply skip through. So everything was growing from a, a very close fan base, a friend, friend, friendship mm-hmm. with all the people around my area. And uh, every now and then somebody brought up a new record, you listen to it, uh, you, you share the records back in the day, you did that. And uh, somehow everybody was looking for the most obscure, weird band never, no one ever has heard about. And that has been groundbreaking cool times back in the days. And well, since everybody my, uh, in my area was pretty much into black and death metal, thrash metal, not too much. Um, well, I was simply growing into that. So most of my friends were listening to the uh, no fashion records, more anthem records, like Dissection, Unanimated. The other guys were listening rather to super weird stuff like Atheist, Pestilence, Atheist, <laughs> of course, yeah. Death, everybody loved. And well, somehow, somehow this... Uh, is still following me. I'm still loving uh, to listening. Uh, I still love to listening to those those old records every now and then. Yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah. It always helps to go back to the to the originals, doesn't it? But I mean, you, you're crafting your own sound, uh, your own way, which is great to hear. And look, I'll make this my final question for you. Australia, uh, have you been to Australia before? Have you toured here before? Because I couldn't see that you had. But have you been here even as a tourist? <laughs> I've never been there as a, as a tourist before, but we got the chance to play uh, a tiny little tour with three shows in Australia, one in New Zealand, before we head over to Japan in 2019. Mm. So that yeah. was really, really cool. We did everything you would do as a tourist. So we visited the Koala Reservoir. Uh, we drank some weird beer in Brisbane. Wonderful times. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we spent the entire... Uh, buy out uh, the first nightclub we've seen so great times I would love to come back <laughs> but next time some some more shows I think back then we played only Brisbane Sydney and uh, what was the other one Hamilton no Wellington in oh, uh, well, New Zealand Wellington in New Zealand there you go wow okay so Brisbane we got to look in yeah that's unusual usually Sydney and Melbourne get the run and then Auckland gets a run so not even Auckland got a run there it was Wellington and Brisbane, yeah, that's great. And was that did Dicey put on that tour for you? Can you remember the touring company? Yeah, it was uh, Soundworks. It was Dicey. There you go. Okay, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Killer. Well, I hope to see you down here again sometime soon. Would be a pleasure. And uh, I reached out to a couple of people already, and we hope to uh, well make it happen again. But first of all, well, there are other problems in the world to, to be solved. Uh, yes, indeed, ah. there are. Yeah, at the moment, no doubt. No, our borders here are still closed, meaning our state border. Not even. I mean, I know our country's oh. border is is a hard is a hard closure at the moment for most people. But um, yeah, our state border is closed. Hopefully, once these bloody van- vaccine mandates have been in in place, um, yeah. I mean, what do we do? The world's in a very interesting interesting space at the moment, to say the least. Well, sooner or later, we'll be done, and. Uh we are happy to come over down under once again and share a drink, <laughs> or maybe two. <laughs> or maybe two. Nice. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Well, look. Good luck with everything. Congratulations on a superb career and indeed this album, a valid a valediction, mate. Just enjoy it. Enjoy the the great response that no doubt it will receive once it's released. Well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure talking to you, and well, I'm very sure we come over with a valediction. <laughs> Absolutely. Look, look forward to it. <laughs> Likewise. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thanks, Stefan. Appreciate it, mate. No worries. Have a good one. 
What'd you think? I enjoyed that chat with Stefan Kumar from Obscura, like so many Germans I've spoken to, just about every German I've spoken to. Very affable, very easy to talk to, easy going, down to earth. Yes, indeed. Now I want to share something with you. I've got a new project happening with Joseph from Bald Headed, Bald Headed Metal. I should check that, shouldn't I, before I start talking about it? Let me go to my subscriptions and make sure it's Bald Headed Metal or it might be Bald Head Metal. Bald Headed Metal, there you go. His channel, Joseph, on YouTube. He invited me to participate in a bit of a metal chit chat thing. So what we do is we just pick a subject and we riff about it for about an hour or thereabouts. It's very enjoyable. Think what the guys such as Eddie, Trunk and Co were doing on that metal show. It's two, if I can say so, very knowledgeable metal appreciators and aficionados waxing lyrical about topics such as who do you prefer more? Iron Maiden or Priest, that sort of thing. We're taking it easy now, but I'm sure we'll get into more complex subject matter a bit later on. We've really only just met, and I'm enjoying the dynamic, I've got to say, because uh, I like the fact that Joseph is a, is a very polite fella, it must be said, so he's easy to talk to from that perspective, but he's knowledgeable too, as I've already mentioned, and uh, an hour goes by very quickly. Those conversations take place at 5 a.m. my time, because of the time differences between us, because Joseph, he's the bald-headed metal. That's him. He's in New York, and it's about two o'clock in the afternoon for him. But these things must be done. And it's a good excuse for me to get up and do something that I enjoy because I've got to get the kids ready to go to school and cats fed and dog fed and all the familial responsibilities lay ahead at that time of the morning. And it's nice to get started with something that I enjoy doing anyway. So do go across and check out Bald Headed Metal. You'll see two episodes posted already. It's titled Metal Chit Chat Podcast. So there you go. My name's Andrew Mackay-Smith and I'm the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast series. That is all for now. Have a great one.